Right. I'll go ahead and get started today. Um, good evening and welcome to this discussion on continuous security, injecting your pipelines with critical protection for your applications. I'm Kamala Desikin, your moderator, and I focus on product marketing for uh, Cloud Platform and uh, the ISV ecosystem at Pivotal, which means I get to work with some really great partners that help us broaden the value of the platform offering that we have. Now, platforms like Cloud Foundry just fundamentally change and speed up development. Now, we've heard a lot about this today uh, from users all day long. So as the platform evolves to support high velocity uh, and continuous application delivery, it's becoming very clear that the traditional bolt-on security um, type of siloed security specialists uh, just won't cut it, right? So we have to rethink the software supply chain completely and think about security at every step of the pipeline. Uh, we have a panel of experts here today, uh, each of whom represents very different aspects of security. Uh, what we're going to try to do here is get their take on how the Cloud Foundry ecosystem is working to rethink security. So please join me in welcoming our, our panelists. Um, I'll start in the middle because he's right. probably not expecting it and I like to pick on people. Mm -hmm. So let's start with you, Josh. <laughs> Hi, I'm Josh Kirkwood. I look after um, DevOps security in the UK and North Europe for CyberArk. A uh, little bit oh, closer? A little, little bit closer? Oh, there we are. There Hi, we go. Josh Kirkwood. I look after DevOps security in the UK and North Europe for CyberArk. Perfect. Simon? Hi, uh, Simon Maple. Thanks, everyone, for coming. I'm uh, one of the uh, developer advocates in SNCC, which is uh, a tool that uh, helps developers uh, adopt all the wonderful best practices of uh, security. Hi, uh, I'm James Wickett. Uh, I work over at Signal Sciences. Uh, we'll, I guess we'll talk more about what we do later, but uh, I work over there as like a developer evangelist uh, uh, type role. Perfect. So let's start with our first question, um, again, with, with Josh, because he started us out. All right. Uh, I'm lucky today. I'm <laughs> perfect for you today. Um, secrets management is one of those security topics that's traditionally been an afterthought in enterprises. Um, the passwords are set up, uh, passwords are set up manually. They're shared with each, you know, with everybody through non-secure methods, uh, like email. They're not rotated. Now tell us why proper secrets management is so important um, in CI/CD pipelines, and and also maybe throw in some examples of where not having them has been an issue. Uh, okay, so um, with my security hat on, Uber 2016, 2014, great examples of really strong secrets management for everybody else. Um, but essentially, it's something you need to deal with across the board. It's a challenge that's been around for more than the last 10 years. And there's been a secrets management problem since before we've been saying DevOps. And essentially not doing it is a form of negligence, right? If you start hard coding credentials in apps, you just end up with technical debt from day one that will be there until you decommission the application. If you fix from the beginning, it's simple and it's done. Um, it's kind of quite a simple one, actually. Please don't hard code credentials. Have you ever, uh, have you ever uh, done a search on GitHub for uh, password <laughs> removed or something like that. My favorite is AWS secret access key. Would firmly recommend it. You yeah. get about half a million results. They're not all keys, but I can guarantee you in the last 24 hours there'll be at least 10 live ones. And if you think of the guys doing that, they're not technically complex enough that this is an IAM role. That's going to be a root account credential. They've probably joined the cryptocurrency revolution the hard way, which means that they're mining a cryptocurrency now. They're not getting paid for it, and stock prices definitely aren't going up. Tesla, 2018, um, good well, and, examples. And, and, and it's real easy for developers to, you know, somehow like check in, you know, I, hey, I've done it, right? You check in commits that, uh, uh, you know, have, have your access key or, or something in there that you don't want exposed. And so this is where like putting tooling in place is really helpful for this, right? You can, you can monitor like this kind of, these kind of commits and kind of stop them before they get into your, your version control or in the history. Because that, that's another thing I often see is like, I removed it, okay, but it's, yeah, but that's the point of version control, right? It has a history of all this stuff, so. And that's it, and there's some brilliant tools out there that cost nothing. Um, personal okay. favorite is Truffle Hog. Just okay. as a way of scanning your repository looking for high entropy strings. You said Truffle Hog. Truffle Hog. Okay. Big fan of truffles. Um, Git Rob as well, is that Git Rob? Yeah, there's Git there's Rob's another Git brilliant Rob. Rob. Yeah, there's yeah. Git Secrets and... Um, um, it's almost like this is Git a known problem. Git Hound is another one. Yeah, yeah. that yeah. everyone should probably be dealing with. 
Um, and if you don't, you end up in really, really interesting situations. I mean, if you ask 14-year-old me when I set up my first WordPress and I you know, pop my database creds in to the old wp.config, that was fine then, but it just isn't fine now. Y you wouldn't do it. So please, don't. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and this is one of those things that uh, people ask me, like, when they're doing CI, CD pipelines or whatever. It's like, well, this is, like, a super easy thing that you can do. This is, takes no compute resources. It takes, like, you know, you know, just a couple hours of someone's time at that, at most, to set this sort of thing up with, you know, filtering for what you need. And then, then you're set for your entire team. So it's a really easy thing. And from day one, it doesn't really cost much. I mean, we yeah. give away our products as open source. Um, everybody else in our segment does. Yeah. There's no need to pay for it from beginning and only when it becomes something that you probably don't want to be running yourself does it need budget yeah but that happens with most things i mean walk around the vendor booths up there most people have a model that's when it's a problem pay for it run it free when you don't need it well the other thing is of course i think people are using bots now to kind of search these get, get repositories and everything so when your opponent is completely automated and you're not that's a problem right well, you can scale up by hiring a ton more staff but i thought we kind of weren't about that I'm pretty sure that's the whole point of being here. Like, we're trying not to throw yeah. engineers at problems and instead you know, make them better through automation and other like, reasonable ideas. But it's absolutely right. I mean, look, the modern 14 year old is definitely about automation when it comes to ruining your <laughs> website or business. They, they don't want to spend a long time doing it. And the methodologies they're exposed to are the same enablement materials that your own engineers are reading. They're going to automate it, right? An AWS free tier account gives you enough compute resource to go to town on GitHub, any public repository. Shodan's glorious for picking things out. Weight Watchers, big fan of Weight Watchers myself. Um, they themselves had open Kubernetes, just chilling. You know, no authentication on it with AWS secret keys sitting in Kubernetes secrets, no authentication to stop people from getting it. And that was found by security researchers using Shodan. It's not hard. It's not difficult, any idiot, myself included, could find your credentials if you hard code them and are careless with them. So, hmm. Particularly in, the into your there. applications. Now, on a similar note, Sneak, uh, this is for Simon. Um, Snick, yeah. Snick, Sneak, Snick. or multiple ways to say this. Snick. Um, Snick, also, yeah. Uh, it lets you I'm, I'm flag, that. I'm going to say it it's then, in that case. Yeah. So, it lets you flag open source security and, and license risks, right? Uh -huh. like that's the product space. Now, the most famous example of this is, of course, the, the Apache struts, or I should say infamous, right, is the Apache struts virus and what happened. Now, the first public exploit of that happened literally a day after it was reported. So there's really not a whole lot of time, uh, despite the patch being available, right? Now, how can enterprises today get in front of something like that? Yeah, so this was earlier this year. For those who hasn't heard of Equifax these days, right. not, not a single hand. I got a year yeah. of free credit protection from that, thank you. Really? Very much. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's a good deal. Yeah, I mean, it's, Equifax aren't the only one, of course. British Airways was a, was a classic example just the other day. I got a year of free credit protection from that. Yeah, I got offered it. My boss, my boss actually said to me, uh, Simon, have you, have you booked any flights recently with British Airways? I said, yeah, I booked one just the other day. And he said, oh, you should probably change your credit card. I said, actually, Guy, I used your credit card, so you should probably change yours. And so that's a true story. He had to change his credit card. But yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, these attacks, we can't, we, it, it's not like they're not going to happen in future. They, are, they will happen. It's a case of when, and it's a case of who. So what protection do we have against these kind of attacks? Well, um, these, these attacks are typically happening from known vulnerabilities. They're, they're vulnerabilities that are not being found out from scratch by every single really smart hacker kind of sitting in a back room with loads of monitors. These are known vulnerabilities and very, very easy to exploit. So, you know, if there's a CVE, the chances are if you just type that CVE in into Google and, and type exploit in, you'll find a hack on GitHub or somewhere like that, and then you just run that hack. And very often, particularly with the Apache struts, uh, Spring Break is another good it's example, whereby there, there are a couple of interesting uh, vulnerabilities whereby so long as you're running a specific version of that package, you, you need to do little else in terms of structure of your application to actually be vulnerable to that. So. The vulnerabilities are really easy to hack. You talked about Shodan and, and, and ways in which people can find out you know, what you're running, what you're using. It's incredibly easy to, for people to find you. So 
you know, if we, if we draw a parallel with maybe uh, on my honeymoon, I went to uh, Kruger Park where there's uh, lions and impalas and everything else around. Uh, do you need to be the fastest impala to keep away from a lion? No, you need to make sure you're not the slowest. And, you know, that's, that's, that, that's all you need to do. If you put, if you put minimal effort in, and, and, you know, you're not so, so vulnerable that someone can, without, you know, too much effort, hack you. Um, that's all you need to do. You need to, you need to be able to outlast a hacker's, um, you know, attention amount of time, span. attention span. And, and, and once, you've done, once you've done that, they'll move on to someone else. You just need to, you know, stop being the obvious target. Um, so how can, how can we do this with a day of notice? Well, you're not going to have a human looking around at every single application package that you're using, every single dependency, who knows how many dependencies they even have in their application? One person, <laughs> direct and indirect? Indirect, yes. indirect as well. You, you must use a tool for that, right? You're not yeah. going to go around counting every single one. So the, 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 yeah, right, absolutely. So Java or Node? Java. Java. Okay, Spring, I presume. Yeah. Right. So you know, when, when you have this you know, amazing number of packages and indirect packages, you need the kind of tooling that will allow you to say, these are the packages you're using, these are the vulnerabilities that you have. And when new vulnerabilities come out, for a tool to say, by the way, you are now vulnerable, here is the suggested fix, and we can automate this for you. That's the kind of thing you need. Now, in the Struts case, in the, in the Equifax case, I think it was a couple of days. OK, it was a couple of days for the, first, for the first hack. But we need to understand there's a difference between a hack and a breach. Okay? A hack is just someone breaking a perimeter. A breach is someone taking sensitive information. And there was at least a month, two months, I think, I can't remember the actual dates, yep. but a, a really good time between the first hack and the breach. It isn't a case of when, a t when an attacker comes in, they just go, smash, I'm going to download your database, and I'm gone. Those it, times are shortening as well. Yeah. We do research from every year, and four years ago it was nearly a year, and now it's down to about 90 days. Mm. So, you know, there's definitely a relevance in automating this. If you oh, don't, yeah. you're and, and I think for a lot of companies, even if they noticed, even if they were made aware, at the time of the public disclosure, sometimes their CI/CD pipelines aren't aren't short enough for them to even, you know, put the right. change yeah. public and, and, and in production before well, that. And happens. to kind of further your metaphor, right? It's like uh, Equifax didn't know that the Impala was getting eaten for yeah. like two months, right? Yeah. Like, like it's not just you know outrunning. It's like they just had no any no no clue that they mm. were they were uh, getting uh, uh, eaten. I mean, this is a dangerous audience to ask the question, but how long roughly does a deploy take you? Uh, is that, we're all going to say it's in the minutes territory, or is that policy that holds you up? You know, change control, anything like this? We, You're talking about whole CD, uh, yeah, total, total cycle whole, time, total yeah, cycle time, git commit to running production. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, is it something you do hourly, daily, weekly? weekly? Huh? No one's going to raise their hand for weekly. Oh, Not in this room. Uh, <laughs> someone will. Well, I think part of the issue is also discoverability, right? Discoverability of, yeah. like, where is the patch? What do I do? What, what comes next? Like, is that something that we can make easier now for, for developers and actually applying the patch, Simon? Well, I mean, so, for example, the company I'm, I'm representing here, SNCC, um, we, we automate a huge amount of not just the discoverability, but uh, we are very opinionated in the way which we suggest uh, the, the fix that you should, you should apply should be done. And then we'll actually go ahead and push pull requests um, so that you as a developer you know, don't just, don't just, aren't just told about what the potential fix is, but we'll actually go ahead and update your POM or your, or your package JSON with the necessary update or a patch that we would handcraft that would, that would alleviate you of that, that vulnerability. Um, so I think, I think tools are extremely helpful but they are definitely not, and this is from a tooling vendor, they are not, you know, you can't buy a tool and say, I'm DevSecOps compliant. Right. There, are, there are many things which, which, you know, you need to change within your organization um, from the, the, the culture of the team, from making sure security is in your processes and through your processes from start to finish, and so that the security team is actually part of your, your overall working focus group, your feature teams. Um, tooling, of course, is there to actually help you achieve that in your processes in a timely fashion, um, but it's certainly not the be-all and end-all. Now, that actually, that reminds me of a fun piece that I read, written by James, uh, where he said that security's shift left should really be shift right. Well, uh, it's um, an and, and. Yeah, yeah. and, a shift right. Now, it's a little unexpected, given what the industry mantra is right now. Mm -hmm. So can you explain uh, what you meant by that? 
and um, explain how yourself, does that actually James. lead to I know, continuous I need to, security? I need to explain. Yeah, you know, uh, it's funny. Just like an hour and a half ago, like I was getting trolled on Twitter for this exact same thing. You know, and it's lovely, right? They copy like the company uh, Twitter handle in there as well, so it's really <laughs> great. Like, uh, I appreciate that. So if you're going to troll me, please make sure my boss gets to see Julie, that. Julie, well. thank you very that. much. Yeah, thank, please, please do that. Um, what's one of the problems? Okay, let's, let's ask a question here. Uh, how many people know if you're under attack right now? How, how many people would know, you know, feel confident that you would know if you're under attack right now or not under attack? Right? That, that's a question that really uh, kept us up at night, especially when we started Signal Sciences. So we, you know, we, we are kind of on the, on the production side, the operation side of, of, uh, of the continuous delivery pipeline when customers are actually using it. And uh, you know, we're, we're looking at application security vulnerabilities like cross-site scripting, SQL injection, all the oldies that we've had you know, since like you know, 15 years ago. Um, and and how, to, how to actually monitor and defend against those. And then we're also looking at other things like bot mitigation or, or uh, feature abuse and misuse or, or uh, any types of, any types of, any logic in your application that you want to instrument uh, the flow of and monitor, uh, uh, you know, we can be able to do that. And then we also correlate things from uh, all sorts of lists, um, you know, like bad actor lists or, or weird anomalous behavior, uh, error codes or anything like that. And then we contextualize the whole thing. And then we let you know, like, is the Impala getting eaten or is it not, right? And like that's kind of our, our, our answer there. Um, so what do I mean by the idea of shift right? I think that, that to a point, we, we sort of have brought this DevSecOps uh, belief that, uh, that we, w we want to do all the shifting left. And I totally think like shifting left is a, is a good approach. And whenever we think of uh, it's putting tooling in the pipeline, um, putting tooling like we just talked about, like the get secret stuff or, or SNCC or other types of uh, things that like, uh, you know, do, do like a software bill of materials. I think all that stuff is really, really great. Um, you, you totally need all the, the shift left early in your pipeline testing stuff. But often we do that to the detriment of actually putting any like good instrumentation. So if you think back to, and, and I have a corollary, corollary here that, that I think is really important for us. When DevOps started uh, in 2009, Patrick Dubois was like, hey, like, it's agile, but for operations, right? And, and kind of marry that, uh, that thing. And I think Patrick was, was totally uh, right on with that, and, and Andrew Schaefer and some other folks whenever that was, that was coming out. And when we were in those like, early days, the, what were the conversations, right? It was like uh, doing better testing, infrastructure as code. Uh, there was also a, a big uh, hinging point on monitoring and actually doing instrumentation where it matters and like putting the operational data back to the developers and developers are going to support this thing. Well, uh, you know, developers also care about security. Um, often they're, they're maligned by security and said that they don't care, that there's like stupid developers or whatever, and I think security people that do that are, are very wrong and uh, wrong-headed in their, their approach with that. But I, I believe that, that we have to look at this uh, in a way where we're adding instrumentation that provides feedback to the developers, just like operations did when they kind of underwent the, the DevOps transformation. Security is doing under that under DevSecOps. Sorry that was really long, but, but I kind of, I think it has to be contextualized in that, that view, so. Right. Perfect. I think that's really helpful for us to understand. Um, you know, I think somehow we, we think that you know, everything should move to the front of the line. It's this also is, important to think about, what's that? No, I was going to say, this is really interesting. When we talk, the yeah. words we're using is like moving things or yeah. shifting things. And yeah. it's, re yeah. it's really not, is it? It's, it's, about, it's about just making sure you have focuses in other areas as well. Right. So it's like, when we talk about shifting left, when we talk about, uh, and the same words we use with performance as well sometimes, yeah. shifting performance left. Yeah. And uh, I think we just need to shift performance. It's like <laughs> shift yeah. security yeah. everywhere, right? Yeah, it's we, it's we about having... We need to expand having, our focus, basically, yeah. rather than this... Like, oh, we're going to improve development. We'll train every developer to be secure, mm. and then we'll replace our security teams with security engineers in there. What we actually need to do is, is sort of pay the same amount of attention across the whole thing. Train our security folk to be engineers. Train our risk people to understand what the hell's going on. Mm -hmm. You know, grow everything rather than just focusing on one part. Yeah, well, and I think your, your corollary there to performance, I think performance and security are very similar in their, their space and how you do problem solving here. And you can rewind to like 2007 or six or whatever when Velocity Conference started out. It was like the weirdest conference idea that O'Reilly ever put together at the time. It was like, we're going to take some front-end developers and we're going to take some back-end operations folks and we're going to jam them into a conference because we want less than two-second page load times, right? 
And like, and so from that, like you had tooling that emit, you know, that, that like people started doing uh, like Wyslow and all that sort of stuff on the front end. You had infrastructure as code and config management and all that stuff. And that was really a birthplace of DevOps, like one of the main places where like DevOps uh, really grew out of, but it was taking these two separate people that in most organizations don't talk to each other and are separated by many layers and many silos and kind of jammed them together in a conference. So I, I don't think that it's a, it was, you know, happenstance that it all kind of happened together. And I think security kind of needs some of that same, same approach, right? Like it's got to, it's got to fit both of those, those sides. Yeah. That's exactly what we're doing, right? Like we kind yeah, of jammed security doing, yeah. right into the... Because at, at, at its know, core, it's about kind of having, having the data, at the, the right data at yeah. the right time. And right. whether that's pulling security left so that the developers understand which vulnerabilities are going in at the time that they're actually putting it in, or whether that's in production, whereby you actually understand what's happening at the right, at the, you know, at the time, and what, what signs are there that a hack might be happening, and things yeah. like that. Yeah. It's about getting those data points at the right time and feeding it to the people who need it, so that right. it's yeah. easier to fix. Telemetry yeah. for everybody. What I find really funny with a lot of this discussion is that everyone sits there talking about improving news observability, and I hate the word. Yeah. Um, What's yeah. it called? Mod monitoring. It's called monitoring. Yeah, it's been go, that for a long time. Go, yeah. It works. Yeah. Um, and then they start building out all these processes around it. And then they start talking to the traditional security people who sit at the back of <coughs> in a basement or somewhere far away from the developers, like you know, the diagrams in 10 deploys a day yeah. 10 years ago, where there's this line between dev and ops. Mm. And they don't realize that there's a SOC, you know, an entire team of reactive engineers focused on looking for events that warrant attention and resolving them. And because there's this dotted line that blocks security from DevOps, they're missing out on this giant team of people that can do their jobs, or sorry, do the boring bits of their jobs for them, the things that you don't want to do, the things that aren't building a new product, that aren't making things move faster. And they just neglect it because they don't want to interact with security folk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not unlike the testers, uh, you know, of, of seven or eight years ago, it's like many many people brought their QA teams in, and um, uh, when we were working on a DevOps project at a large enterprise, we, uh, you know, we just sat down with the testing team and was like, okay, like, let's let's go over like test automation stuff, and like in it, just like night and day, like the the way that the team functioned and how the performance worked, and um, and it, it kind of brought them into the whole development cycle as part of the team instead of kind of this separate. Oh, that's the QA group that we we send stuff over to. It seems like we covered a lot of ground here, right? Yeah, yeah, sorry. We, we talked about, you know, some of the soft spots um, that people would be able to exploit and just, you know, it's not like they're super sophisticated. Hackers are not super sophisticated. Um, they just look for vulnerabilities that, or things that we might have forgotten to do. Um, now, what are the steps that enterprises can take to, first of all, um, find these kinds of soft spots, right, where problems in applications that are already out there, um, and more, and also, secondly, what about the newer applications, right? Like, what does that ideal pipeline look like to you? And that's really yeah. for all of you yeah, no, in your various fields. All right, yeah, fields. okay, so I have a, I have a uh, presentation that I've given recently, and I can, I can send the link to you as well, but it's, uh, it kind of goes through the whole CI, CD pipeline and breaks down each stage of the pipeline um, with some ideas of security tools that you can use. And, you know, every stage is different depending on your language um, and, and uh, what, you know, how you're... Um, how you're architected and, and what you're, how you're producing this out, but uh, I'd be happy to share that as a useful thing. Um, and I took some of that and I distilled it into a course for uh, LinkedIn Learning that's going to be hitting. If you have a LinkedIn Learning subscription, you can check that out, and that comes out within the next couple weeks. So, yeah, perfect. Yeah. I think I think the first thing before we even think about tools is from a company yeah. point of view. Yeah. Everyone, everyone talks about, uh, and it's a phrase, I've already said DevSecOps, but it's another phrase I'm not massively keen on, digital transformation. If anyone wants to leave the room when I say that, they, you're welcome to. Um, digital transformation, effectively, yeah, just trying to push, push jobs through CI, CD quicker, being able to release faster. Um, but yeah, the problem with that is things like performance, things like security, yeah. they get left behind because they're traditionally you know, not designed to fit in those kind of short time-lapsed uh, release cycles. And... And I think it, the first thing to do is to make sure that the team is actually structured in a way that when you get tools and change processes, the right people are talking to each other, having security people in from the very first design meeting, um, you know, talking to developers, talking about talking with the architect about the differences that you need to think about when you're thinking about a serverless uh, architecture versus a monolith architecture or a microservices architecture. Um, you know, those, those kind of things. First of all, I think that's, that's massively the first, the biggest thing. I think it was uh, uh, Martin Fowler when he was talking about people adopting microservices. 
unless you have a team whereby you have lots of many, many teams, each representing a kind of single service, unless you have that, you won't actually design and create a microservices architecture. If you have one massive team, all you're actually going to do is have what you think are modular microservices, yeah. but they're actually, you're actually just creating a, a, a monolith with light boundaries. And if you, if you really want to structure your application, structure your, your environment to, to deal with security, you need to change the way you yeah, work, change the organization. Yeah. So that's the first thing I would say. So I'll weigh in on a different one, because I completely agree with both these points. Yeah. Yeah. But a lot of them this tend to... This is a to panel. You shouldn't agree. Come on. Yeah. Let's, okay. let's disagree. Okay. Yeah. Both Drop the points. mic on us. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to pay for it. It's expensive. <laughs> it's a really good mic. So I think a lot of those tackle the moving forwards side of things. And security isn't something that you, you draw a line in the sand and say, right, from this point on, everything's secure. Because that's how you get hacked. Um, I think actually sitting down and trying to break down the walls organizationally first and saying... What sucks? Ask the question of a open room full of people inside your organization. Tell them that no one will get fired. Bring in some pizza and beer and say, right, everyone in here will know something bad. Let's write a list of these. Let's find the low-hanging fruit. Let's you know, collect them all together and fix them. And often, you know, your developer will pick out something like, my app doesn't log well enough. There'll be a guy who knows how to fix that in a heartbeat. Improve that, you gain visibility. Mm -hmm. You get back to this. But you have to start with the old stuff first. Because otherwise you get lost in this, but everything new we're doing is secure, which is a really good way of not fixing anything. You haven't heard of Docker, have you? <laughs> no, uh, you know, one, uh, just, uh, just joke. Uh, um, you know, one uh, thing I'd recommend for folks, uh, if you're doing uh, like, uh, you know, agile or, or weekly or, or, or sprinting, you know, for development cycles, which a lot of people are, you kind of read security stuff and they're like, oh, threat model. And it's like this big, gigantic process. And, you know, and they only, you know, security really only wants to do it like once a year, if that, right? But there's a new one called Mozilla Rapid Risk Assessments. And I'd recommend checking it out. It's built to do 30-minute uh, tabletop exercises that you do once, one time per sprint. And then uh, over time, you build out like a holistic threat model uh, together. But uh, like that's, that's, that's a great thing because it's basically that idea of like, okay, what do we think is wrong with this thing? Uh, what, are the, what are the pieces we're changing in the application? Okay, what does that mean for authentication? And, and other pieces that are critical. Okay, thanks. Good meeting. See y'all in two weeks, right? And and that's uh, it's a good process. And we've been seeing some uh, some companies that are kind of leading edge security do that kind of stuff. And to, to maybe give some more practical advice yeah. into CD, CI/CD pipeline, yeah. I think you know looking from the moment a developer starts writing code. I think there are actions and, act and security activities yeah. that you don't need to be a security expert to do, um, but will harden your environment. And I can talk from the, from the vulnerability side, uh, from the open source vulnerability side, and we'll use PCF as, a, as, an, as an example as well. Um, from, from the minute a developer writes code, okay, they're going to be writing code. There's potential for, for them actually writing their own vulnerabilities, writing their own vulnerable code. So there's, there are tools available that can actually, do, that can actually uh, you know, scan your source code, have some static analysis of your source code. You're also going to be pulling in vulnerable libraries. There are tools, uh, SNCC is a, a, an example of one of them, that can, that can check the vulnerable libraries that you're using against its vulnerable uh, library database. And it can tell you which vulnerable libraries you are using, which uh, are the remediation steps. Um, so if you have vulnerabilities in your direct or transitive dependencies, you can get remediation steps as to this is the direct dependency you need to be using to get the transitive dependencies without vulnerabilities. Uh, and then you know, that can end up as an automated pull request, which can make that change for you. Then when you go into CI, CD, your CI environment, your Jenkins build, that can also run a full, uh, a full test to check your vulnerabilities and, yep. and fail the build if... Uh, you know, you are using vulnerable code, you are pulling in vulnerable code. You know, when a developer sends a pull request, we, for example, at SNCC, we automatically test every single pull request on a webhook so that any chance, you know, any, any delta of code changes that a developer will put into that pull request right. will be tested. And, you know, you can set it up to fail a merge if, uh, if, if new vulnerabilities are being added. And then, you know, pushing into production, if a new vulnerability occurs, what happens? Well, one of the things we do is we automatically create a pull request against your repository with the fix. So, you know, these are the, you don't need to be a, a really in-depth, detailed security expert yep. to do this. You just need to be aware that of the problems and aware of the solutions, and you then go in and, and try and, you know, enact those solutions. So those are some 
some practical advice in the kind of CI CD pipeline. Well, and, if you guys have a, there's a point too where we kind of bring security into the fold. Uh, Paul, Paul Trzaski in his last session was like, we got to drag security into this because like sometimes that's that's one of the problems. And uh, and I was thinking recently, like I was talking at a, at a security kind of insider security thing, and uh, I was like, yeah, linting, and they were like, linting, never never heard of it, no idea, right? And you're like, okay, like well, you can actually do some some like easy quick security checks doing some linting, right? And so we kind of talked through that process, but. Um, exposing them to kind of what hooks and, and, and things are in place in the pipeline, like because th you know they're, they're you know security people are smart people. You just gotta like help bring them along for the the process. Otherwise, we'll we'll kind of continue the silos. So we're getting towards one of my favorite points in this, which is enabling services. You yeah. mentioned it on Twitter. Creepy. I've been reading his Twitter. I get bored. Oh yeah. Um, there's a paved roads from Netflix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The idea being that if your security team are doing it well, they'll start offering services. You know, we'll deal with your logs, we'll deal with your WAF, we'll deal with managing the packages you're using so these aren't problems for you. And that when you start doing this right, you get to this magical guide rails, not gates. Yeah. Or my personal favorite, the carrot shaped stick. Mm -hmm. The idea being that, you know, you can do it any way you want, but if you don't do it our way, it's not going to work. Yeah. And that's when you really start improving the security whilst making it a process they barely notice. They're just walking along a road. Or yeah. Yeah, I had a friend of mine who came up to me and he said, uh, hey, uh, he works at a big enterprise. They're just now getting the DevOps in the cloud, so, you know, whatever. But, but a lot of folks are in, in that, can be in that space. And uh, he said, uh, okay, what, what should I do? I'm security guy, director of security. And I said, uh, yeah, you need to, like, never say no. Like, you need to, like, um, be, you just need to figure out a way to always say yes to these people because they're ready to, like, route around you and, like, just, just do whatever they want. There is nothing more creative than a dev told no. Yeah, and, and so, the, and yeah, and I think, like, building this paved road, like, that, that they do on Netflix is, like, uh, make it so it's, like, it's easy and, you know, free to get security. And, and really, that's really security's only option because we don't have enough people in the industry to fill the vacant seats now, much less if, like, we tried to staff up, you know, more. So, like, their only way is to automate themselves through this process, so. I think we're a little bit over time. Do we have a few minutes to do questions, or should we just? Um... Like one question. All right. One burning do, question. Do we have one question for for the panel? Otherwise, half a question. Is it really sneak? Is it? It's uh, it's sneak. Okay. All right. It's kind of in between the two. I will never get that right. <laughs> well, that is not something I would have thought of at all. <laughs> <laughs> all right, going once, going twice. All right, so I want to thank our panel today. Um, a big thank you, and, and of course, you audience today for your time. Um, it's been a pretty good discussion. Uh, I think it's a lot of progress that the ecosystem has made, I guess, o overall for the platform, and I think using and extending some of the capabilities of Cloud Foundry so that um, you know customers can essentially implement those um, think of security not just, you know, hey, I bought myself a platform um, or I bought myself a couple tools. You really think about the picture as a whole. All right, that brings us to the end of the session. Thanks, everybody.